Welcome back everybody. It's been a while since I made a video. I've been a little bit busy, just haven't had time recently, but I wanted to create another video and add it to the channel. So usually I do tutorial videos that show you how to accomplish a task. They tend to be more educational in the sense of teaching you how to do something. Today I'm going to do something a little different. I hope you guys enjoy it. What it's going to be is kind of a retrospect look at Windows 95. So I call, I'm calling this video 20 years later, Windows 95. Hopefully you enjoy this. So what am I going to talk about? So anybody you know can list some of the largest changes in Windows, like oh it had the start menu, it had this, it had that. Um, I'll, I'll be doing that to, to some degree. However, I'm also going to delve into the history behind those changes, such as how the start button actually came to be designed. Um, I'll also discuss some of the changes to the general computing landscape and success and challenges of technology um, that Windows 95 encountered due to its era and what was happening in the industry at that point. So what did Windows 95 bring? I'll start with the big one, everybody knows this, is the start button. So when you hear start button, basically you think Windows. It really did revolutionize the Windows experience in GUI. Uh, Windows 3.1 was a prior version of Windows. Um, <clears throat> and what it looked like was essentially Windows Explorer. So you would navigate through a folder of folders and they would be on your desktop. There was no centralized location to actually access all of your programs. The shell was very, very different. <clears throat> so the concept of the start button was actually conceived by a person named Dan Oran. He was a behavioral pathologist. So Microsoft brought him on board to basically change the inter interface of Windows. They recognized that <clears throat> you know Windows was not the most user-friendly or as user-friendly as it had to be and Microsoft in their wisdom at the time kind of went down a, a, a radical or different path uh, instead of turning over to the programmers to make an interface they brought in somebody to do studies and help design the interface <clears throat> so Oran actually conducted some experience and he would watch how actual customers used older versions of window like 3.1 when he gave them instructions so when he was doing this, he would have with him, you know, a number of the Microsoft Windows programmers and designers. So one of the participants of note took 20 minutes trying to figure out how to do something as simple as opening up a text editor um, after he was, you know, provided instructions on how to do so. So one of the Windows programmers that was watching at the time actually said, our customers are morons. So after, so then after, after they talked to the user, that was having that difficulty opening that text editor, they actually discovered he was a propulsion engineer for Boeing. So quite literally, Windows was too hard for a rocket scientist to use. So there had to be a better way. So the concept that came to his mind was a single button that led to everything. So it's kind of funny that the button originally was actually called System. Uh, in the one of the trial versions or interfaces for Windows 95 that was coming up, so the users, they refused to touch the button, the, the system button. They were scared of it because it was a system button. Um, once they changed it from system to start, users actually understood its function and you know they were successful in using it. In fact, test subjects for the start button, after they were renamed it start, um, were able to complete tasks before even being provided instructions on how to do so. So it was obviously much more intuitive um, and the rest, as they say, at that point is history. The start button is actually so successful. Um, <coughs> Windows 10 just recently launched within maybe, I don't know, a week and a half ago. And the return of the start button is one of the headlining features of Windows. Just to tell you how successful it is. Personally, I'm a big fan of the start button. I like it. I, I consider it similar to the steering wheel, right? Steering wheel has been around for a lot of, lot of years, for, you know, tens of decades I don't know what since 1909 or 1904 whatnot when the Model T's first came out, but you know it's been around for like over 100 years and it's still being used today because it's so successful. And I'm sure some old farm tractors and whatnot even before then used steering wheels. It's just a successful way to control a vehicle. A start button is a excellent, excellent way to organize an interface for a computer, at least in my opinion. So here's a couple of things that I think were really cool that I came across. So this is actually a sketch, the one of the original concept sketches 
of the start menu done by that Dan Aran guy. So you can see, you know, um, this how it's called system. They had programs, documents, controls. Uh, they even had at some point to install EXEs. Uh, I believe down here, yeah, there's install now. Uh, they considered a control panel settings. There's a whole list of different things here. Um, so programs actually go to all EXEs on the computer. That was the original design of it. So a very, very different radical interface and obviously underwent many refinements. So another change that came along was the taskbar. So it was a pretty large challenge using Windows 3.1. Uh, people had difficulty managing the programs they had open. So in the Windows 3.1 days, you go through a series of folders to get to the file you wanted or the program you wanted to run. You'd open it. If you shrunk that down, it didn't like shrink it down to a taskbar or anything else. It just stuck it on the desktop, which is likely behind like you know half a dozen windows at this point, difficult to find. And people would eventually just open up another copy of the same program. And they would run out of memory. Um, it just wasn't ultra stable. It was just a, also a very inefficient way of doing things. Um, <clears throat> so this, the task part was actually designed by Dan Oran as well. So he came up with an idea of a tabbed interface to list running programs. So the original tabbed interface he came up with, however, it was too large. So most monitors at the time, if you can believe it, were 640 by 480 resolution. Um, they, they were CRT screens, dinky things, like 13, 14 inches. Uh, you know, if you're just using computers today or, or you haven't ever experienced that, you're really not missing a whole bunch because it wasn't that great, but it was great at the time. Um, so, in fact, later on in this presentation, I'm going to pull up a, a version of Windows 95 I have installed on a VM. And you actually, I have it set to 640 by 480 resolution. So you get to see really how little this thing really was. Um, <clears throat> so the tabbed interface that was too large because of the original design on a small screen, he shrunk it down to, to smaller tabbed interface was shrunk down to some smaller buttons, which is how the taskbar came about. So the taskbar and start button, they were merged on the edge of the screen for convenience. It was also speculated that it was placed on the bottom of the screen instead of the top due to worries of legal action by Apple because it did look somewhat similar to Apple's top menu at the time. So here's actually, again, some of the um, concepts that Microsoft was running with with the start button and the, and the taskbar. You can see this is quite a bit taller and if you're on this tab, you have programs here, and, and you know you would tab through, and it would change everything else under it. Um, you're wasting a bunch of real estate. And again, see how much doesn't look that much smaller here, but believe me, um, at the time, you know every pixel mattered because you didn't have uh, quite the desktop real estate you have nowadays. Uh, and here you can see the famous system button as they were coming up to make. Um, it looks like they, they what they also did at that point was added on the clock some little icons for things like printer statuses, battery status, <clears throat> and they made uh, the icons on the taskbar programs that are running, uh, they made the icons a little bit easier to identify versus little small Nikki pictures. So another thing that came along with Windows 95 um, was plug and play. So the concept itself was introduced well before Windows 95 came out. However, Windows 95 successfully made it mainstream, right? So prior to auto configuration of hardware, users had to set what were called dip switches. They're basically little like physical switches that like you can see up here in the upper left corner. Um, and each one was a flag to say, hey, you want it on DMA12 or, you know, different IRQs. So you actually actually set different channels and configure the hardware prior to putting it into the computer. Otherwise, when you try to access or install the hardware, it wouldn't work. Um, so IBM released the PS2 computer with something called MCA. So every piece of hardware came with a floppy disk that would auto configure the hardware to work on that computer. So that was definitely a, a step forward in having to do dip switches. However, it was not without its draw drawbacks. So one thing, lost disks cause problems. So a PC wouldn't boot until it was until that unconfigured hardware was removed. So say uh, your your floppy disk went bad or you lost your floppy disk or what have you that would configure that hardware you would actually have to take it out of the machine to get to the machine to boot because until it was configured it would lock the computer essentially. 
So I, and also another drawback is IBM, they wanted to exclude clone manufacturers and also force licensing royalties for MCA hardware. So M IBM wanted a fee for every piece of hardware that used this MCA hardware configuration system. Um, and also clones back in those days, they were still, they weren't as hotly as contested as they were in the uh, like early, early days of PC computing. Um, but IBM was putting a war against the clones, almost like if you made Apple compatible computers now, uh, you would have some issues with Apple going after you uh, uh, for legal grounds. IBM was trying to be the only producer for IBM compatible computers, and their hardware came at quite a price premium. <clears throat> okay, so Windows 95 also tried to fully automate device configuration and it would use manual settings if necessary. Uh, so full auto detection of hardware was a new process and it was without full industry support. There could be a mix of devices in a system, some that were capable of automatic configuration and some that still use manual settings, such as jumpers and dip switches. So the old world of DOS still was part of Windows 95, it ran on top of it. So this complex set of circumstances led to the auto detection process you know, to sometimes produce incorrect results. But by, by and large, it was a large step forward and it started to bring out um, auto configuration of hardware to the mainstream. And, you know, obviously as time went on, Microsoft was more and more successful in making the plug and play process work smoothly. Nowadays, uh, you can just plug things in. I plug in this headset. Uh, it's a USB headset with a microphone that I unplug when I'm done using it. I plug it in and it links up, it auto configures, and it's ready to go in about 10 seconds. So prior to that, you'd had to manually configure anything. It was a headache to get hardware working. So another thing that came about with Windows 95 was the right click. So for the first time ever in Windows, the right mouse button had a standard functionality. So up to that point, the right, right mouse button was controlled by each individual application. And in a lot of cases, many applications didn't even use the right mouse button. So, you know, you could right click in one program and, get it, and it would perform an action. Another program would pop up a menu, but the menu items between different programs would be completely different. There was no standardization. So what it did is it standardized items like, you know, copy, cut, paste, etc. commands into those right click menus. So I want you to consider using Windows today without that right click functionality. Uh, let's try it sometime. This, you know, don't use a, the right mouse button, only the left mouse button. Um, it really changed, you know, how you interface with the computer and the efficiency of it. Another thing it came up with was, and this is kind of a technical item, but it still is important to consider, is FAT32. So what FAT is, is it's called the file allocation table. It's the number of bits that, you know, are, are used in this table system. And again, it might be a little bit technical um, for you guys to consider if you're not familiar with it, but essentially, uh, the more bits, the more possibilities, which means you can, you know, store more things, essentially. Uh, you have more file tables. You have more room in that file table. So, um, what it allowed is, and keep in mind, back in the time when Windows 95 came out, hardware was really evolving quite rapidly. Um, I remember I had a, a computer that I installed Windows 95 on that had Windows 3.1, but it was the last year, it was like right, it was in 1994 before Windows 95 came out. So it was relatively up to date. And that thing had a 400 megabyte hard drive. Maybe it was not even that 380. It was something really small. It was under 500 megabytes, which is like ridiculously small by today's standards. Uh, but at the time, it was relatively large. Uh, fast forward two years later, and they had hard drives that were on new computers that were routinely selling, you know, uh, for, you know, in the four gigabyte range. So at that point in time, before FAT32, the previous version of FAT was FAT16. That particular device, um, or particular FAT system, if I remember correctly, it would only do disk drives up to two gigabytes um, versus the kind of standard four gigabytes that were coming out in systems. So the, you had to have a base or a new system to address or be able to access all that storage. So FAT32 is actually still used today um, 
Yeah, we obviously use NTFS on a lot of file systems as well, but FAT32 can still use 512 uh, byte sectors to score, store two terabytes of data, or it's also compatible with a 4K sector size, which will address hard drives of up to 16 terabytes, and there's not hard drives that size yet. So this FAT, inter, this FAT file system that was introduced with Windows 95, so we're talking a file system 20 years old, still is adequate for addressing today's hard drive sizes, which is quite impressive, to, to be honest. Um, and that was introduced with Windows 95 OSR2 uh, in 1996. So it was an upgraded version of Windows 95, like a like comments like we have service packs now that was OSR, what you would, I think it was operating service release. Um, also, one big thing at the time, because DOS slide underneath is FAT32, it didn't take a lot more memory or s conventional memory to utilize and run that file system. So that was a big boon. They were able to re reuse a lot of the FAT16 code when they designed FAT32. Uh, another thing that it came up with is long file names. So this came out with Windows 95. It was a major usability improvement and allowed you to give files descriptive names. Uh, before that, you would have to use an 8.3 uh, file extension. So that was essentially eight characters to, for the name of the file and then the three character extension. We still have extensions now like TXT, EXE, etc. Uh, but they were limited to three characters. Uh, now we can have much more than that. <laughs> so what this did is it allowed you to organize things in a way that made sense. So say you wanted to have tax files for 1995, because that was the year. If you were using the old system, you'd have to make up a name like TXFL for tax file, then 1995. And you couldn't write out, you know, my tax return 1995 and store it that way. Um, the root of that 8.3 limitation almost kind of came down to the similar to the y2k i'm not sure if everybody here remembers that but the y2k thing was when they used to use system dates as two characters like we write dates out now like you know um one slash one slash 15 for january 1st 2015 uh they only use the first the last two should say the last two numbers of the year so that was where the Y2K thing came around when the century flipped over. Um, kind of in the same concept. You know, back so back in the day when they designed this 8.3 file system, hard drives were incredibly expensive. I remember seeing advertisements for, you know, uh, a 20 or 100 megabyte, actually around 120 megabyte hard disk, and they were, it was like over $1,000 for a hard disk. So, you know, back then they wanted to cons conserve as much space as they can, just like they tried to conserve memory back when they designed the two date system. So obviously with, you know, as we talked about earlier with hard drive sizes increasing so rapidly at that point in time, we now had the, the room to use to allow file names to be more descriptive. And Microsoft brought that out with Windows 95. Another thing that came out um, during with Windows 95 is built in TCP IP protocols. So prior to Windows 95, TCP IP protocols were not actually included with Windows. So what is the TCP IP protocol I'm talking about? Basically, that's what you use to get on the internet. So, you know, back in those days, your computers did not have by standard internet access. You could not connect them online. Um, so third party implementations of TCP IP came out. They had to be installed. Uh, the most common was something called Trumpet Winsock. Um, I believe it was reduced by a guy named Peter Tang, or I, I forget the guy's name exactly offhand, but he made a, a program that was shareware that it was shared that you could install on your computer as a TCP IP protocol. This particular version you're seeing here is actually the, the Windows 3.1 version. Yes, I did use that at one point. Um, internet and Windows 3.1 um, was pretty atrocious, but again, at the time, it was pretty incredible. But by today's standards, I don't know how you could use that. Um, so the built-in dial-up support of TCP IP uh, made it easier to access and get online in Windows 95. If later versions of Windows 95 also came with uh, Microsoft Internet Explorer, as much as we hate it now, and it's outdated and was recently replaced with Microsoft Edge. Um, at the time, 
uh, you know, it was actually an okay browser. In fact, Windows up until that point didn't even have a web browser built in. So you'd actually have to buy a web browser at a store. Netscape Navigator was one of the big ones and install it into your computer before you could even have a web browser to go online. So Trumpet, uh, when you worked with it, you make scripts and they were kind of like using AT commands. You'd issue to a modem via hyperterminal. Um, it was a really complex process um, at the time. And Windows 95 changed that by making it much easier for you to get online. So as mentioned, we talked about online a little bit, of course. Uh, it really did, Windows 95 did coincide with the beginning of the rise in popularity of the internet. So obviously there was like AOL for Windows 3.1 and you can kind of see that coming up from, you know, uh, kind of like around the 1992 range and forward. But if you look here at the beginning of um, 1995, you know, roughly 10% of the people had internet access. By the end, um, you were looking at, you know, around the 18% mark and as, oops, I, as you went on, um, you know, it was quite incredible the amount of people that Windows 95 gave access to Internet to. Uh, in fact, if you look, I mean, it's, it was just a up, big uphill swing um, right around when Windows 95 came out. And largely that is because of the you know TCP IP and Microsoft Internet Explorer, etc. being included with Windows 95. It also comes down to partially as well, because uh, there's a number of factors realistically. Uh, more ISPs were available. Um, computers had started to come down in price to the point where uh, your average family could buy one uh, and have a computer, you know, in, in their home. And, you know, they wouldn't have multiple like you have nowadays, and they weren't, you know, you couldn't go to Best Buy and pick one up for 300 bucks. Um, you know, they were still in the $1,000 plus range for a computer, but, you know, that was it was within the reach of a family, um, which also, of course, increased that. So, ironically, Windows 95 um, had some drawbacks to it. Yeah, ironically, right? But it had some drawbacks to it in the, in the fact that, that co coincided with the rise of the internet. So prior to that point, um, you know, you didn't really go online. If you sh if you had a program, you put it on a disk and bring it back and forth to work, like your database files, or your Microsoft Word files. You would save it on floppy disks. I remember saving school projects and stuff on floppy disks when I was a kid, because um, you didn't have the internet. There's there was no Dropbox or anything along those lines to store your files to, right? So Windows ninety five. While it did include those those protocols for accessing the internet, what really wasn't taken into account is when you put your computer on the internet, it's accessible to anybody on that internet. Um, so, you know, there were a whole bunch of security risks. Viruses really took off. Um, before that, viruses were mainly done, you know, again, by disk. It would infect your disk, and you would infect your computer with the virus by bringing home an infected floppy disk. That's how you get a virus in your computer. Um, so obviously accessing the internet made it much easier for those things to propagate and uh, for criminals, cyber criminals as you would call them I guess I don't like that term but for lack of better terms cyber criminals to try to access, hack your computer, install um, you know, key logging software, all types of things on the computer and um, that really became a rise in prevalence. Uh, the earlier viruses, a lot of them actually were less harm, harmful than the ones we have nowadays. Currently, there's lots of things going on, like uh, crypto locker and basically ransomware things that will encrypt your files and then demand a payment to get your files back. Uh, back in those days, the viruses tended, most for the most part, tended to do things that were... Um, more entertaining for the virus writer like it would put a bunch of x's on your screen and if you clicked it it doubled so then you have two and if you click that it would double and have three so they would do things like that as jokes to people um that weren't necessarily intrinsically in trying trying to extract money directly from you um so overall i would say windows 95 Realistically, it was one of the most influential operating systems in the PC industry. Yeah, poor typing by me on that one. Uh, quite a bit here on this last page, it looks like. So, 
you know, the start button, it's around with us today. I mean, th this is something that is you is commonly used on interfaces, something we come to expect. And as mentioned, Windows 9, Windows 10 even came hallmarked with the return of the start button. Um, but it also made great leaps to make things more accessible, <clears throat> adding usability features that really enhanced the user experience. It was more of a revolutionary OS than an evolutionary operating system. So, um, it you know it inc included those core components to increase ease of internet usage and getting online, making it more easy for the average person to go online, and it also introduced some core graphics user interface changes, you know that are still with us today. So. What we're going to do here is I'm going to hop over to a VM and we're going to toy around with Windows 95 just for a little bit. All right, so I've got my Windows 95 VM. We're going to boot it up here, get Windows 95 going. Yeah, remind me later. So this was actually how big a 640 screen was. So as you can see, it's about uh, a third of the width and maybe one and a half times as high. Um, so the average computer has, you know, approximately six times the desktop real estate or more. Um, that's for a single screen computer. So it really kind of shows you how little um, or how little real estate there was on the average screen. There were six 800 by 600s. So they were around then too, but they were more expensive and a lot of people did not have access to those at the time. So. And back in those days, you you buy a computer with the monitor and everything all at one, you know. So this is what you would be greedy with. And largely, you know, it does look kind of like the Windows 7 overall layout. In the bottom right-hand corner, you still have the clock uh, with system utilities, etc. Um, the start button in the left and desktop icons. So of the My Computer icon, you can right-click and go to Properties to show the uh, the system the system settings, right? Um, and how much memory they would have and so forth. Um, again, the w nice Windows 95 logo. I did actually install Netscape on here. We're going to try to go online and see if it works. Um, I also have Win... So I've got this connected to my network. It actually has an IP address. Everything should be up and running. I installed network card drivers. Um, so kind of look at it. it. What did it include? So it included things like, you know, um, internet... Explorer, right, to go online, hit internet, um, an MS DOS prompt because hey, it actually still was uh, MS DOS underneath. The Windows Explorer, which we use today, still it's a, it's received number of facelifts, but by, by and large, a lot of this stuff is you know very similar in layout and general appearance. If you were familiar with Windows 95, um, you could probably pick up a Windows 7 computer and hop on it and you know use it within very minimal amount of uh, training or or fumbling through to access things and get it working right so let's take a look Netscape Navigator on uh, next point next Netscape 6.2 is the last version of Netscape to access or be installable on Windows 95 and hey what do you know Google came up so let's maybe do something like news. So resolving host news. Ah, back in the day, they actually did not have um, search in the uh, the the bar up here. You actually had to manually type things out. Let's go back to Google. We'll type in news in the search bar in new news. There we go. Try that again. So yeah, it looks like for the most part, it's uh, browsing the internet and going going through on online just fine. Um, but realistically, this was the beginning of the modern computing that we have today. You know, this is uh, the start of that um, in terms of this modern desktop interface that you get. Is Fox News going to load up? Even though I don't like Fox News that much, but isn't going to load up. It certainly looks like it's going to load up. Uh, obviously, you can't really see much because uh, this browser is really, really old. I think Netscape 6 probably came out in like 2003 or something like that. Am I right? Uh, let's see. 2001. So, yeah. So, Netscape 6 is really, really old. Uh, but that being said, it seems to work okay. Uh, all right. So, that 
sums up pretty much my cover coverage of Windows 95. But I do want to hear from you guys. So what do you guys think about Windows 95? What were your experiences using it? Do you remember using it? And do you have any different opinions on any of the features that I do? I, I'd love to hear your guys' uh, thoughts. Uh, again, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. And until next time, you have a great day.